Welcome back to our final Q&A session. I hope you've really enjoyed those. We've had some uh, amazing questions come. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to start with one for Rami. Um, and one of the questions was, uh, can an asteroid be captured by a planet's gravitational pull and become a moon? So the short answer is yes. And in fact, if uh, I think Hillary already alluded to this in her talk earlier when she talked about Phobos and Demos. So we think that Phobos and Demos, the two moons of uh, Mars, are in fact captured asteroids. Uh, but uh, not only that, we actually expect and we think that most of the small moons surrounding the, particularly the gas and ice giants, are captured bodies from the Kuiper belt. So a lot of these bodies that started off in the asteroid belt or the Kuiper belt through the perturbations, uh, gravitational perturbations, particularly with, the, with Neptune and Jupiter, end up migrating and uh, being captured by uh, by planet and, and turn and they turn into moons. Thank you. Uh, we've had another question for Georgia actually about the temperatures that uh, um, so particularly when they're coming in through the atmosphere. Okay uh, yeah that's a very good question so um, temperature of meteorites uh, depends what we're discussing here, if it's fireballs themselves or if it's the objects once they reach the ground. Uh, I think Hillary went into a lot of detail with regards to the fact that you have different scenarios re with respect to how, for example, angle of attack in when they're entering the, um, the atmosphere. And um, Temperatures have been measured from a point of view of intensity in terms of uh, uh, quantity of light, uh, comparing these to black body emission. And uh, the average measurement of some of the fireballs that have been detected were in about the, the few thousand degrees. Uh, but then you have to differentiate in the case of, for example, if there is a flash, if there is an explosion, uh, then you can have much, much higher, uh, much more higher temperatures. So there have been some recorded explosions which measured more than six, seven thousand degrees. Uh, and, and, and that's with relation to the temperature of sort of uh, once they get into the atmosphere. Um, the, the objects themselves, when they, once they reach into the ground, is, is different. It depends, again, in, if, if, they, uh, if they're slowed down and then they're free in free fall. So you can have objects which are almost uh, at ambient temperature once they reach the ground and others which reach the ground with uh, still a substantial amount of kinetic energy will be extremely hot. So we had a really interesting question come in, and I think Hillary and Francisco might want to join in this one, uh, maybe uh, first, uh, about elements um, in um, meteorites that come through. Is there any chance that there could be elements that don't exist on Earth? Um, I would say no, because the chemistry of the solar system is basically governed by the chemistry of the, uh, the primitive nebula that the solar system was formed from. And uh, that, in turn, uh, if we look at the sun, we can figure out the composition of the sun um, through spectroscopy. But we can also work out the composition of um, the most primitive meteorites, the ones that Ian was talking about, the CIs. And we find out that they're, they're, um, when you take away the hydrogen and helium, they're actually very, very similar. And we can actually detect all the elements that exist on Earth. We can uh, detect almost all of those in the sun. Um, and we find all of them in uh, the CI chondrites. So, no, I don't think there's any um, any unusual elements out. Uh, if I may... Uh say something i don't know if you can hear me because i couldn't hear hillary very well but uh, is that okay can you hear me okay okay well look, look about new chemical and i have by as one of my uh, mouse mats is a is a periodic table and i say the atomic structure of all the chemical elements has been described and that the atomic number, which is the number of protons in the nuclei of the atoms, all the uh, possible uh, chemical elements are in the periodic table. There is nothing missing there. There is nothing that hasn't been discovered. So that is a very important thing because that is a universal 
kind of, of, of uh, map that we have of the composition of the universe, nothing, it's a kind of mineral, a kind of combination of molecules that happen in space that we are not aware of. That's a different story. But they, when it comes to chemical elements, I think they are all, they are all, um, they have all been uh, discovered. Thank you. And then back to Hillary, there are some interesting questions about how the size and chemistry of the uh, chondral can tell us something about the impacts that have been going on um, in, in these bodies. Oh, do you want the five minute answer or the half hour one? Um, yes. <laughs> Yes, I mean, this is a, a subject that people have worked on extensively. Um, but unfortunately, the uh, once these chondrules have been made, they then get sorted, um, and they get sorted according to their size and to a very minor extent according to their um, density. So they get sorted towards the middle of the pane of the solar nebula. Um, and so they by the time they've been, uh, they've undergone that, um, process they can't really tell very much about the the um, impact on them what we do know is that they're extremely abundant so we've got to have a process that is a very common process in the solar nebula in, in the early solar system um, and we also have to have a process that subsequently sorts them according to their size Thank you. A, a sort of related question was about um, how do we know where some of these meteorites come from? So, for example, how do we know a meteorite on Earth has come from the Moon or, or, or Mars? Well, that's, yes, that's a fascinating topic. Um, well, the easy answer for the Moon is that we've had people go there and bring lunar rocks back. So the Apollo astronauts brought back lots of uh, materials that we've been analysing ever since. And the um, we can so therefore we can compare the kinds of material we get in our meteorites to those rocks that are from um, the moon. So that's an easy one. We can compare them, um, you know, one and the other. Uh, Mars is a bit more difficult, but in fact it has been shown that the meteorites if they're all a bit younger than the uh, 4.5 billion year. Um, age of most meteorites. We have a series of small young, smaller meteorites, young meteorites, I mean, um, that are uh, that have glass in them and in the glass, um, dissolved into the glass while the glass was still on its parent planet, Mars, um, it captured the uh, composition of the atmosphere. So we can actually liberate the composition of the atmosphere from the glass inside the meteorites and it agrees perfectly with the observed composition of the uh, atmosphere of Mars. So that uh, we don't have any rocks brought back from Mars yet, although, you know, I mean, <laughs> I would really love to um, to be there when the first Martian rocks are, are brought back from a, a, a mission. Um, but we don't need that, we can tell, um, because of the, uh, the, the the gases involved in the, um, in the, the glass. The gas inside the glass gives it away. Thank you. And uh, another related question um, about differentiated ashes. Um, how do they acquire structure? What's, what's the research telling us in those regards? Okay, well, differentiated asteroids um, are asteroids that were hot enough to start to melt. And the heat that they, that helped them to melt, comes from impact, which is the, the, obviously you, you uh, turn the potential energy into kinetic energy into heat energy um, and you also um, so, so there's a lot of heat inside a uh, an impact but there's also a thing called the um, short-lived isotopes short-lived radioactive isotopes that were present in the solar system at the beginning of the solar system um, about four, four five billion years ago and there are two um, aluminium 26 uh, and uh, iron 60 and they're very um, radioactive. Uh, they're so radioactive that they have now decayed away completely, so we don't have any of these, but we, we can determine from their decay products that they existed in the early solar system. 
And aluminium and iron are pretty common minerals, uh, common elements, and uh, they make up minerals of, um, of um, many asteroids. So if there was lots of um, uh, hot, uh, lots of heat from the, um, the decay of these two short-lived radioactive isotopes, it would have heated up the interior of the asteroid. And then um, basically what we think happens is that the, the um, metal melts first, and forms liquid metal, and that is um, drained down towards the center of the planet. It's dense, so under gravity it drains towards the, uh, the core. Uh, and that leaves behind uh, the silicate minerals, which form the, the mantle um, and the crust. So you can, uh, we think that that's what happened to Vesta, um, and we think that that's what happened to a lot of other asteroids that have since broken up and, and dispersed. Thank you. Uh, we had a lot of interest in, in Ian's talk as well about some of the uh, questions that are coming up about some of the the uh, aspects of ethics um, and what it's like and um, should we really be mining space. So before we start on that, I just wanted to talk about something. So how much to determine what kind of elements are underneath these actually You spoke about on the moon's surface, you have these uh, patches where different elements are. How, how do we know that and how have we determined that? Well, so we don't at the moment. I mean, at the moment, the, the work proceeds by trying to assign different meteorite classes. Obviously, we know what's in all the meteorites for all the reasons Hillary has said with great detail. Um, and then we try and assign those to particular asteroids based on the spectral properties of the asteroids. Uh, then, as Hillary said, we have to allow for the fact that space weathering affects the, uh, the spectral properties of asteroids. So you can't be absolutely certain. And that's kind of why it's important that these sample return missions like Hayabusa 2 and OSIRIS-REx bring back samples because that will help us calibrate the spectroscopy to make us more uh, confident that particular types of meteorites come from particular types of asteroids. And once we've assigned that, then we do know what's below the surface because we've got all these meteorites that we can measure uh, elemental abundances uh, to in great precision. Can I just say that we also know something Thank you. about... Thank uh, linked question to that. Oh, sorry. Go on, Hillary, continue. Sorry, I was going to say that um, when an asteroid uh, impacts the surface of somewhere like the moon, it throws up material from deeper inside the moon. So we can actually see what's inside the moon by looking at what's been thrown out of uh, meteor craters. Thank you. And I had a linked question, which is that about the, um, the atmosphere. So obviously on the Earth, we've got this atmosphere, which is um, uh, causing these meteorites to burn up as they come through. To come through. How does that change? Them? And how might studying rocks from the, the moon or meteorites from the moon and potentially Mars in the future, uh, would that tell us anything different? It's a bit of a, uh, so maybe a bit for Giorgio about the thermal properties and Hillary about the actual chemistry mm -hmm. elements. Sorry, the, the the question, the first question you had is with regards to the difference between the impacts of uh, meteorites on the moon. Is that what you're asking? I think Ian would yes, be better please. place to answer that one. <laughs> there are Ian. Or, or I can move on and answer the other so, question. You Hillary, had uh, the chemistry. Um, yes, please do. Yes, okay. please. Sorry, so the sorry. other question that you had was about temperature of the asteroids themselves. Um, so there isn't a set value that that is uh, is considered to be the average temperature. I mean, it depends what you know, which asteroids and which their conditions are. Uh, a short answer will be usually most asteroids are found in temperature around 200 Kelvin or about minus 70 degrees. But uh, truth be told, uh, they strongly depend from their compositions. There are Bido, 
which is basically how black they are with respect to the absorption, the emission of radiation. And then there is a there is a game that you play in terms of the estimation, uh, because the asteroids will absorb light from the sun depending on their distance, and then they will re-emit at their own temperature. So you can get anything in between uh, something which is about below uh, sort of a minus 100 degrees centigrade to about ambient temperature on Earth, like 300 Kelvin. Uh, there have been measurements made with infrared uh, instruments, like uh, ELISA had a, had a temperature measured uh, between 285 and 290 something Kelvin. Uh, and then again, uh, it depends on the rotation curve. So you, asteroids have a rotation time, which can be anything between uh, uh, sort of around an hour to uh, a few hours. And as we know from, from the moon itself, you, you can have a vast range of temperatures. If you think of the, the parts of the moon which are exposed to solar radiation are usually above 100 degrees Celsius. And, and as Ian and, uh, and, uh, has shown earlier in the talk, you can have areas of the craters which never see uh, solar illumination, which are as low as uh, 40, 50 degrees above the absolute zero. So there is, you know, there's a, a very, a, quite a variety of temperatures for the asteroids. Thank you. Uh, so the question is about uh, whether or not there is a governing body sort of, uh, I'll, I'll read the exact question. Is there a governing body for ethics protecting the space for scientific research over commercial exploration and mining and possible contamination? So I think this one's definitely for you. So no, there isn't and, and there should be. So this is a really, really important question. Uh, and it is a um, it is something that's missing in international space law. Uh, at the moment, activities in space are governed by the 1967 Outer Space Treaty of the United Nations, and this proposed put, put, put some restrictions on what nation national governments can do in space. Like you can't um, plant a flag in a planetary body and claim it as your own. You can't appropriate a planetary body under international law. But the 1967 treaty was um, was drawn up before commercial activities in space were imagined and when there were only really the United States and the then Soviet Union who could do it anyway. Um, and so the, the, the international law hasn't caught up with the new reality of, of, of space resource utilization. So it's a missing area in international law, and, uh, and it needs to be, um, uh, this hole needs to be filled uh, as soon as possible, in my opinion, because I think there should be uh, clearly an international regulatory regime that does govern activities in space, uh, commercial activities in space, partly, uh, as the question alludes to, to protect sites of special scientific interest. Um, but also to give the, um, the would-be commercial companies operating in space, reassurance, clarity as to where they're allowed to operate and where they're not allowed to operate, because only when they have this clarity will they um, invest money in, 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 in their activities. And I do come back to something, a point that I tried to make in my, my talk. I do think science has an interest in these space commercial ent entities um, um, pursuing some of these interests. Because by it, it is all about making money, but, but space exploration is expensive. And unless we can get space to pay for itself somehow, then our activities in space are likely to be much um, more restricted than what they would be otherwise. Having said that, of course, there needs to be a legal regime that protects special sites of, uh, sites of special scientific interest. Um, and, uh, and there isn't one yet, and there should be. Francisco, would you like to add anything? I uh, fully agree with, with Ian, of course, and I will go a little bit even further because uh, um, I don't know if we are repeating what happened after the discovery of America, the continent, and we are now uh, going into space with a, with a commercial kind of um, uh, attitude that has uh, disastrous consequences as we are living part of that of course there are no rainforests to be destroyed in space and uh, in the end in the end do we need more materials do we need more iron and nickel and aluminum and gold and the rest of it 
just their expensive. We have plenty of recycling to do here, and we have to grow as humanity, in countries or individual companies. We should be going into space as a, as a, as a kind of a coordinated nations and collaborate. Space is very risky, expensive, and the more people, the more, the more uh, institutions you put there, the more countries you put there, the better. This is the example of Antarctica. This is example in a minute scale, if you like, on the International Space Station. It should be done like that. Imagine go to the moon. This is my territory. This is because you are invading my, my country, say, in, in, in on the moon. I mean, it becomes ridiculous if we extrapolate what we have done on this planet. So, can I, yeah, can I, can I say something, Mark? Uh, yes, so, so I agree, of course. Of course, of course Francisco, we should be going out into space as a united humanity, and we have to have international um, institutions that will make that, uh, give some reality to that. So I agree, I agree with that completely. Uh, we, you, no nation state can claim a bit of the moon of its own. That, that clearly would be in violation of the existing international law. So hopefully that's not likely to happen. But nevertheless, uh, you're right. We need, a, we need to explore space as a united human species, and we have to develop legal and political institutions that will enable us to do that. But if I can just come back to the point you started with, um, about do we need more metals and things? Well, the answer is no, we don't. Clearly, we don't need more iron on the earth or more nickel on the earth and probably not even any more platinum on the earth. Um, but that's not what space resources is all about, really. Space resource utilization is about mining things in space that we would need to use in space rather than having to lift it out of the earth's gravity. So the main economic arguments for using space resources are not to mine them in space to bring them to the earth, uh, but to mine them in space to use in space. So we have a decision before us. I mean, the, hum the united humanity has a, has a decision before us, and it's do we want to explore space or not? And do we want to explore space on a large enough scale that's sort of commensurate to the scale of space, which is enormous? Um, which will require a lot of large exploratory equipment, sort of bases on the moon and Mars and spaceships and all sorts of things. These, if we want to do that, we are going to have to utilize space resources to manufacture them. So that's the choice before us, really. Do we want to continue to explore space on a large scale? If so, we're going to need to use space resources. Or do we not want to explore space, in which case we can stay on our own little planet and not explore space, and then we don't need space resources. Thank you. So uh, there's two more yeah, questions yeah, that I, I want fully to sort of agree, add uh, into uh, each other. So yeah, so the last last question is sort of more about the practicalities of it. So you've got to start constructing this infrastructure in space. How is that possible? And linked to that, would it does it involve manned missions, or or is this is there are other ways of doing this? So I I, I come back to so I think Ian probably well, is the best I, I, I'm, to that. I'm happy to make a start. Um, so a space infrastructure is going to have to be bootstrapped from essentially nothing because currently we don't have one, and in the more distant future we might want one that enables us to carry on our space exploration activities. So it's going to have to start slowly. Um, I think it, and it would start, I think, initially by utilizing water, either water from the poles of the moon or water from hydrated asteroids um, as, a, uh, as a source for fuel for space propulsion, so hydrogen and oxygen propellant. Um, whether we need humans in space, really, really, this really depends on what we want to do in space. If we, want, if we want to really explore space in the same extent that we like explore the Earth, then yeah, I would argue we need humans exploring space because we need humans to explore the Earth. Um, so, and, and then we'd need the resources that could facilitate that. If on the other hand, we don't want to explore space in a really large scale way, and we're content with what little robotic vehicles can achieve launched from the Earth, then we don't need humans in space and then we won't need so many space resources. So really it comes down to a choice. What, what is the human future in space? Do we, do we want one or do we not? 
Um, and then once we've decided what we want to do in space, this will decide the level of resources that we need. Unless anyone has anything else to add, I think that might be a perfect place to end it. Um, so thank you very much for attending today. Uh, I hope you've had a fantastic uh, time learning all about asteroids, uh, meteorites, and uh, a lot. Uh, any questions we didn't get around to ask answering, uh, we're going to try and uh, up on our online, either in written form or um, small videos. Um, and what I'm going to do, I'm going to send out another uh, information on Eventbrite about how to access all that information. Um, and a small evaluation as well, because I'd be really happy for you to, um, be really grateful for you to receive information about how this day went. So thank you all again. Um, I hope you'd uh, give a small round of applause for all our speakers. Um, they've done a fantastic job today and um, in answering your questions as well. Um, and uh, we hope to see you at an event soon. So thank you very much. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.